everybody, it's Dr. Sean. How are you doing? I am Dr. Sean from Project Forgive. Typically show up on Mondays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern to do some kind of a lecture. Usually you know the topic ahead of time. And tonight's topic is a goodie. It is caregiving for a painful parent. And um, it's gonna be a little bit different tonight. I usually do a structure and all that. The, the thing that I'm finding that works best is giving three ideas to support you in caregiving for a painful parent because our brain grasps in threes. And um, before we get started, a little bit, a couple of announcements. One is we have a Joy is a Habit Facebook group. If you're inspired to just get infused with some joy, join our group. Um, anything I mention, of course, I'll put links up. Also, we have the Apology Workshop coming up in January. It's here on Facebook. You can check it out. It's also on our website at projectforgive.com. The next one, I believe, is January 3rd. Those workshops are on Zoom, and there's a cost to them. They're $6.99. If you have any struggle whatsoever to pay to join the group, we have scholarships. People give us stars whenever you give us stars, and thank you for those, by the way. It actually supports folks to come to our workshops. And um, the apology you'll never receive is actually what we're most known for. And it's about internal growth and how you work through your own forgiveness separate of the other person. If they're a jerk, if they would never apologize, if they're past, if they've passed and they're, they've gone on. And the tool is really, really powerful. So if that inspires you, we'd love to have you join us. And uh, check out our store. We got lots of stuff for the store. We even created a, a package for the holidays. If that's something that moves you, we have essential oil. We have masks. We have our apology necklace. And we have new, new um, items coming. And uh, hence the reason why I'm in Florida. I'm in Florida today. I'm typically in Detroit. And uh, my daughter is going through some painful stuff with her family. And uh, she's in a high-risk pregnancy. So... I came to come support, so I'm a little limited in what I can do these days, at least until the baby comes, and so uh, I'm just really committed, and it's being in that sandwich generation. My last lecture was on the sandwich generation, and what that means is here you are, you're doing your healing work, whatever that means for you. No one previously has done it, like nobody in my family did any kind of healing work. I come from lots of painful situations and family situations from alcoholism to incest to rageaholic, rageaholicism, that's such a word. Um, and then here you are doing your work, healing from your own past, your own pain, and you have children and grandchildren, and you're watching those generations repeat those patterns. And what kind of a stand can you be in not only healing yourself, working with that older generation and then working with the younger generation. That's why I call it a sandwich. It's like you're sandwiched in between everybody's pain <laughs> when you're trying to change something generationally. And that's one of the reasons why I picked tonight's topic, um, caregiving for a painful parent. There's three things that I'm going to mention tonight, like I said, because our brain grasps at threes, pardon me. And um, I have to tell you, I spent one year with my mother, very painful relationship, um, I was the outcast. I was the one who was the troublemaker. I was the one that wasn't falling in line in the family. I was the one who went to therapy and 12-step programs and did all the incest work and went to college. None of my family had ever gone to college. And um, so I was an outsider. And uh, coupled with the fact my mother really struggled with me. My mother was a narcissist. I, both my parents were narcissists. My father was a heroin addict. And... Um, it's a miracle that I'm even alive, quite frankly. And this last year that I spent with her, she's passed now, just a little over a year. She died from cancer, and it was the most grueling year of my life, caregiving her, because my sister passed just before my mother um, started to decline with cancer. And uh, it was also the most rewarding. I had the most breakthroughs. Um, I really feel like my mother prepared me for so much. Um, by going through that year with her caregiving her. So I want to give you my best three tips for caregiving, um, the things that I learned and how I opened my heart to really, truly forgive her. I do think forgiveness is a lifelong process, especially if you come from a painful childhood, and that it's a process, not an event. And even this caregiving is a process, not an event. And for those that are dealing with parents, or a parent that you're caregiving and 
maybe they're they have a disease or dementia or Alzheimer's or cancer and um, you can see the end coming for them or not maybe there is no end that would kind of be hard too um, there's three things that I was really thinking about that if I could like tell my best friend what to do and what not to do and three things to focus on these would be them okay so let me get started I see you guys are here hello everybody hi Deborah hi Mary I see you guys hi Bruce Jeannie's in the house. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Denise. Josie's here. Randy's here. I see you guys. Hey, Joe. What's shaking? Hi, Jody. Hi, Heather from Arkansas. How fun. Hi, Angie. It's so nice to see you. Whenever I see your name, I feel happy, too. Terry's in the house. Hey, Terry. Greta, Susanna. I see you guys. Let's see. I'm just looking really quick to see if you're saying anything before I get started. Your husband's a caregiver, Vicki. I so get it. Yep. So here's the three things. And I've put them in order of importance, meaning the third will be the most important. One of the things that really helped me when I was caregiving with my mother, my mother lived 30 minutes away from me. And um, like the last six months, I was pretty much staying at her house, like sleeping over because uh, she needed the care. And um, prior to that, one of, my, one of the benefits I had is I have my own business. So it's good and it's bad in that I can set my own schedule and it's also hard if I'm over giving my time to be able to get work done so I can pay my bills right so one of the things I really prepared for I knew there were specific outings that she really liked to do and one of them was grocery shop she loved to go grocery shopping and um, the dilemma was is every time we go grocery shopping it was like a four-hour deal like no joke not kidding it literally from leaving, from driving to her, leaving her house, driving to the grocery store, getting what we needed to get, um, helping her get in a wheelchair or whatever, or pulling up the car for her to get back in the car, loading the groceries, then taking them back to her house and unloading the groceries. And it was an ordeal. Um, one of the things that made it palatable was she would say things like, it touches me to even say it, she'd say, let's enjoy the grocery shopping because who knows how long I'll be able to do this. And she was right. Um, it lasted about six months. And then after that, I was just doing the grocery shopping for her. That really moves me because it's also something that carried me. This is not going to last forever, I'd say to myself. Um, I'd block out four hours to go grocery shopping so that I wouldn't have meetings or appointments um, my office staff was amazing to allow me to do that. If you're in a caregiver situation, um, chances are you have some leeway to be able to do that. Maybe you're working on your own time, and you can put it in time frames. And so the time frames really work. So when I'd go see my mom to take her grocery shopping, for instance, and this can be for just about anything, okay? I'd say, okay, mom, I've allotted four hours, so our goal is to get back here at 4.30 or whatever. And she would abide by that because she was so touched that I allowed the four hours, right? I see you guys are showing up. Hi, Sandra. It's nice to see your name. We're talking about caregiving for a painful parent. So the first thing is preparing yourself for time and saying it out loud. Okay, we need to take you to the doctor's. I've allowed three hours for this because typically it takes about an hour and a half to two hours. That gives us enough time for driving. And, um, and then my mom would be less reluctant to ask me to do other things because I allotted three hours. So it was just a time boundary that helped soothe the task and not put me in a position that I had to feel guilty for saying no. Right? So like if I take her grocery shop and she says, okay, now I need you to sew this or do this or do that. Be like, I'm so sorry, Mom, I, set, I allotted four hours today. And she was very amenable to that because I set those boundaries with her. The time boundaries were so, so, so important. I see someone saying about, yeah. Yep, I'm looking to see what you're saying, Mary. Yeah, I got it. Yep, she's talking about caring for her father after her mother died. Totally get it. All right, so number two, I'm doing three things. Number two is the painful language. Now, I'm an empath, like I feel everything. Can anybody else relate to that? Um, I was like the sensitive one in the family. Everyone else was so cerebral or couldn't feel, I don't know, they were just very different than me. And so small things would really hurt my feelings. So I had to really find ways 
to negotiate and navigate with my mom because pretty much 90% of what came out of her mouth was painful and mean-spirited, quite honestly. Um, she was very mean-spirited, and um, it was hard, right? So I tried different tactics. So the reason I'm telling you this is don't give up hope um, in terms of saying, well, that's the way it is, and she's going to always treat me like that. That's BS. It's so BS because if I can break through this, I believe you can. And I did find a way to stop the incessant harshness towards me. I didn't learn this till I was 55, okay? So, but because I gave up. I gave up on my mom and that she would ever be kind to me. And I'm not saying she was unduly kind to me near the end because she wasn't. It was still hard. But there were, and there were more moments of kindness than there were moments of harshness. And what I did is I started to play. And how I played is if she'd say something to me, I would just talk to myself and I would say, what if she were really joking? She's not, trust me, she's not. When she says, oh my gosh, your hair looks terrible. That was not an uncommon thing for my mom to say. My mom was hairdresser, okay? Hair was a big deal to her. Not uncommon for her to say. And so I started playing and coming up with new quick-witted responses, not hurt responses, because I so wanted to be heard by her. I wanted her to hear that she's hurting my feelings, okay? And she couldn't hear that. She could not hear that. Um, her narcissism was so great. And um, so I started playing with it. And so when she say things like, your hair looks terrible today, I would look at her and I'd say, I need to hang out with you more because you make me feel so good. And she would laugh, an uncomfortable laugh, and she would stop. For whatever reason, that worked with my mom. So the reason I'm saying this to you, to try different responses. Um, boy, you're so hard to deal with. You might practice something, and I'm just making crap up, okay? You might practice something back at you, mama. <laughs> Maybe that'll work. And the reason I'm saying it like this, because I don't know what would work for you in your situation to try some different things. The key here, though, is to try some different things. One thing significant happened. I'm with you, Jude. I so get it. Yeah. It's, and if you're dealing with a painful parent, I so get it. I went through, I was like this. Right? Some days I'm like, oh, I can't even bear facing her today. She's so mean. One time she was overly incessant okay overly incessant fix that move she was big on systems in her um her tv antennas and so i'm like a pretzel trying to move her antenna for her no you're doing it wrong no do that try that finally i just looked at her and i yelled at her i've never yelled at my mother i'm i've never have we i come from the age era of you children are to be seen and not heard. You treat your parents with dignity and respect, even if they have no clue what that means for you as a child. Um, that was very ingrained in me. So for me to lose my temper with my mother was significant. And that might be something you need to do, saying, I need you to stop. I can't take it. Stop. This is horrible and painful. That's what someone similar to, I said to my mom. She was in shock. She, her mouth just went... She couldn't believe, and she, you know, she did the, oh, you're so mean to me, and I just let her be there, and it subs a lot of the incessantness subsided, and you can even do really strong boundaries of if she's, if he or she is being really incessant, that parent's being really harsh, you can say, you know what, it's obvious you cannot be compassionate and kind. I'm going to take a 15-minute break, and I'll be back in 15 minutes. If you're stuck and having to take care of them, and I say stuck meaning you can't leave them alone, you can take 15-minute breaks. I'm going to go take a 15-minute break because my heart can't take how you're talking to me. That's another tactic to use. Um, so my, my encouragement around this is to try different things. And you could, you're going to outrageously fail. You, you're gonna, and the, the thing is, you don't want it to stop you from trying different things because I kept trying different things till the humor really, really worked. And I'm sure it's a combination of many things that worked and um, being unstoppable. And it's the number three that really had me have breakthroughs. Now, if you have a painful parent, 
chances are they are narcissistic, they are very focused on themselves, they have no clue what validation is to validate their child. I, I don't even remember, remember my mother even ever saying I was a good mother, ever in my life, okay? So my mother was not a complimentary person or validation person. And um, one of the things I practiced and got really, really good at that actually serves me today as here I am in Florida supporting my daughter going through a divorce, very painful time for her. It's very messy. She's also seven months pregnant. It's a very painful time. And um, the skill that I'm about to share is the skill that's even helping me be her here and not be overly codependent taking care of everything. Because I'd come here exhausted, leave exhausted, and I'm, I've got some really good boundaries in place because of my experience with my mom. Yeah, I'm with you, Sandra. Lots of ups and downs. The biggest breakthrough came from playing this thought in my mind. Now, let me put some context to it. As children, when we grow up with painful parents, the truth is all we want to be is loved and taken care of and told we're adored and treated with dignity and respect. And it, we really want to be adored. And when we grow up with painful parents, that does not happen, especially if you have a heroin addict dad or a narcissistic mother. These parents can't can't it's like trying to go to the hardware going trying to go to the hardware store to get milk there's no milk at the hardware store and so what happens is that us children would become adult children and we take care of the parents can you guys relating to this we take care of our parents i feel like i was the parent since i was born i've been making decisions and strategizing since i was three years old how to get through this and my job was to take care of my mother and her emotional needs that was my job so here I am, 55 at the time when I'm with my mom, I'm 57 now, and I'm like, what if, what if, and I'm talking to myself, what if, Shawnee, you decide consciously to take care of your, of your mother, not unconsciously as a little four-year-old trying to get your needs met, because that will never happen, it's never going to work, but what if me, as an adult, I choose to take care of her? consciously and that was my saving grace because anytime the shit hit the fan excuse my language because shit hit the fan all the time it was a shit show most of the time I would remind myself Sean you're an adult you're 55 years old you're not a four-year-old trying to get your needs met from someone who could never ever 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 meet basic needs they she just does not have those skills she doesn't she did it and what if I gave her grace, it touches me to say this, I gave her grace and chose to parent her as an adult woman. And whenever I would say that to myself, I'd get so grounded in the moment as an act of grace, an act of forgiveness, and an act of compassion. And that I was able to do that by saying that to myself, because what I was really doing is parenting myself and choosing to parent my adult my, my elderly parent by choice. And whatever that looks like, and little things that I did to help foster that is putting a picture of her as a little girl on my computer. It's still up on my computer back in Detroit. I have a, little, a picture of my mom and me as little girls. And it's my reminder to forgive my mother continuously for everything that I went through because a little girl raised a little girl. And that's really the truth. A little girl raised a little girl and it's not to say it's okay what she did it's not to it's none of that it's to give me compassion for her and her wounds she did not do the journey that I did of healing she never chose that for whatever reason I don't think she could because if she would have she could have right Sandra that's perfect full of grace and mercy not codependency not sacrificing myself for her because those are very, those are martyrdom places, and I've been a martyr. Anybody else been a martyr? There's no joy in being a martyr. There's no joy in being a martyr. And when you can do these things, like prepare with time, um, address the painful language, and find ways to navigate that and negotiate that, as well as consciously choose to parent your parent, you will gain some serious skills, like serious skills. Um, serious skills, right?
let me see, labor of love. Uh, my mom helped her find, when my mom hit, I'm reading what Jeff's writing. My mom had her final illness, I helped take care of her. It was a labor of love and she was dying. My sister and I forgave her and told her that we loved her. And that's beautiful, Jeff. You know, um, for some of us with narcissistic parents, my mother, even though I grew up being molested, alcoholism, all that, the, it was the conversation in my family system wasn't that my mom asking for forgiveness. It was her demanding forgiveness from me for keeping her away from her grandchildren because I was in therapy. I was taking my kids to couple, counseling, doing all kinds of things because I grew up in a really screwed up household and I, wasn't, I was committed to not repeating history. Of course, history does repeat. It's better. It's progress, not perfection. And um, what I'm loving about what Jeff said is that that forgiveness that you gave your mom with your sister um, that will carry you for the rest of your life. Because I, one of the things I kept thinking about when I was caregiving was how am I going to feel when she passes? How am, where am I going to be at? How am I going to feel? What's that going to look like for me? And I wanted to feel clean in integrity, knowing I did the best that I possibly could. Um, it was a very complicated grief when we come from dysfunctional families, it's complicated grief because parts of you are glad she's dead. Yay. Parts of you are so sad she's gone. Miss her laugh, miss the dark humor. She had really great sense of humor. And we had some really precious moments that last year. And uh, I don't even think the precious moments would have came if I hadn't done these three boundary type things. My own internal boundary of reminding myself that I'm choosing to take care of her as an adult, not as a four-year-old. And creating language to stop the abuse, the abuse of language, because that's intolerable. I don't know how any, uh, if you're going to your mother's house or your father's house and you're caregiving and they're, say, they're talking crap to you and treating you so abusively, that's not gonna work either. That would never work. It's like, oh, I can live through that for a year. No, I was like, I'm not living through this for a year. I've gotta do something for however long that she's gonna be around. So I'm really, really hoping you'll be able to put some boundaries in place. And um, the thing is, too, when your painful parent is in a caregiving situation, you have a lot more power to speak your truth. Um, doesn't mean that you can emotionally do it because it takes emotional courage to do it. And uh, I just really encourage you to take some risks and say some things you normally wouldn't say. And you could totally screw it up. You could really screw up and you just say sorry because... For me, it's efforting, trying something new. Try something new, it's 90% on. Say sorry, and then get, you'll eventually get to 100% on. And that's how the process was with my mom, right? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. You did do a lot of things right, Laura. I'm with you. You'd happen exactly how it's supposed to be for you. Yeah, I'm with you, Noreen. I'm with you. That's all I got tonight. I'm not giving away any prizes tonight. Sorry, normally I give away a prize. I'm in Florida. And I'll be back in two weeks in Michigan just for a short, brief stint to get some work handled and meet with some clients. And then I'm coming back um, because I committed to support my daughter out of choice, not out of obligation, not out of codependency. And I feel so blessed that I can be here for those that missed it, she's getting divorced. Um, she's seven months pregnant. She already has two other children. So her and I are a well-oiled machine running this household, you know, and I'm doing this by choice. And the other piece, it makes me love my husband so much because my husband was like, how could you not not do that? And, uh, and I'll be her birthing partner, you know, because that's what there is to do. Mixed, sad, hard, happy, good, exciting, joyful, miserable, anguish, anxiety, it's all of the above. And, uh, and in some ways too, I know that it's like when you talk about COVID, one of the best gifts of COVID, and there's COVID's a mixed bag too, right? So many people have passed, there's so many pieces to it. COVID has really forced me to figure out what's important to me. And I know many of you can relate to that. Thank you for that, Jeannie, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And the reason I, sh and people ask me, you know, boy, I love that you share this stuff. I can really relate. And that's why I do share it here. This, you know, when I, when I do trainings, I'm primarily a corporate trainer. I share some personal stuff that's appropriate and corporate, but not to this level. 
that I do here on Facebook. It feels so important to me on Facebook because I know that I attract people like me here on Project Forgive. And then I know that we're all doing the best we can. And um, it's just nice to have some truth telling sometimes. And that's my biggest commitment on Project Forgive is to do truth telling. And uh, however that looks, okay? Thank you for the stars. Aw, thank you, Terry. You're so amazing. I appreciate you. Um, appreciate the stars because they help bless those that can't afford to come to the workshops, okay? All right, that's it. I'll be back in two weeks. I will still be here back in two weeks on the 13th. I think I'm going to do, um, I was thinking about anxiety because I'm struggling with anxiety. Can anybody relate to anxiety? And uh, things to do to soothe anxiety. And I found some neat tricks that I'm using that are actually helping with soothing the anxiety. And, uh, you know, for all of it, all the court cases, racial strife, COVID, this new variant, um, are we going to be having to lock down again? You know, there's so much uncertainty, and it's a prime place for anxiety to start growing and fostering and fermenting would be the word I would use. So we'll, do, we'll talk about anxiety um, in two weeks, okay? So I think that's the 13th off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Big love, everybody. Joy to be with you. I miss you guys, and uh, I'll see you really soon, okay? All right. Big love. Bye.